pastor has gone crazy. Something's going on here. What's this all about? And so a third time he stood up and he said, Beloved, let us love one another. And he sat down and the awkward silence continued for a very, very long time. And one by one, the people began to get what he was talking about. And so they turned to the person sitting next to them and they asked questions. What's your name? Where are you from? What's going on in your life? And little by little, over the next hour, the congregation spent their time just getting to know one another. And before the service was over, there was a little girl in the back who had just, her car had broken down and she couldn't get to work. And over here was a mechanic who said, I'll fix it. And there was a young couple sitting over here and, and they had, they had just gotten married and, and he didn't know what to do. He didn't have a job. And sure enough, there was a plumber over here and he said, I need help. Can you come and work as a plumber for me? And little by little, cars got repaired and jobs were found and houses were bought and uh, or people found homes to uh, places to stay. And as the congregation gathered together, became more acquainted, all of the needs began to be met in that church. Just by these simple words, beloved, let us love one another. Now, we've been talking about love. We, the first week we talked about love does crazy things. And this week we're talking about, or last week we talked about uh, uh, love forgives. And this morning, I just wanted to, to just use these two words, love is, love is. Scripture talks a lot about love and how we should I identify ourselves as people of love. In fact, Scripture talks so much about love that the people were known, the people of Christ were known by the way that they loved each other. It wouldn't be what we say or what we say we believe. It's not even by what we do. It's who we are. No, he said we would identify ourselves with the simple, the simple way. Behold how they love one another. So it's tempting to think that there's, no, that there's a lot more to love than just doing it. But love literally is a verb. <laughs> We love one another. Love isn't something we fall into or fall out of. Love is something that we become. And so let's talk a little more about what it means to love this morning. We've been reading the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and sometimes I get up and I read that verse, and every single time I read through it, God points to something and says, by the way, what about? And by the way, what about? And my reading of scripture turns into not just confession, but instructions on how I can love better. You can study love. Love isn't just big words. Um, we only have one word for love in the English language, and that is love. So if we studied in English the word love, it wouldn't take us very far. You love pizza, you love your puppy dog, you love your wife, you love to go on vacation, and we use the same word for all of those things. We love key lime pie, and by the way, I do love key lime pie. It's not a matter of academics. You can't just gather around in a classroom and, and sit and lecture about love. There's no school to learn how to love your neighbor. People don't need information. They want examples of love. And so I feel a little bit like an imposter this morning standing before you talking about love. <laughs> but hopefully this will be a springboard for us to carry with, with us. We understand that people don't need information about love. They don't want us to examine the word love. They want examples of love. People don't grow where they're informed 
or given information, people grow when they feel others love and accept them. So we don't just agree with scripture that we just read. We don't just say, oh, that's a great, that's, oh, that's a great example. Those words were well-crafted. In fact, I even agree with it. When Jesus gathered his disciples or his apprentices together around him and said, guys, I don't want you just to agree with me. I want you to go do what I've shown you to do. He wants us to do what he said, and he said he wants us to love everybody always. So what does that mean about love for us? Love is not a matter of academics. It's not a matter of teaching and learning. It's not a matter of studying the word itself. It's not a matter of appearances. You know what makes a bride look terrific? It's not that the bride is necessarily beautiful. It's not the beautiful dress she wears or the amazing venue that she's in or the flowers or the music or any of those things. Although those things add to the beauty. What makes the bride look beautiful is that everybody in the room understands that the groom has chosen her to be his and she has chosen him to be hers. You see, the beauty comes not with the outward appearances, but with what is in the heart of the person. The two of them, everybody knows it, can't wait to spend the rest of their lives together and we gather together to appreciate that and enjoy the love that is being shared. In Southern Sudan, there is the custom of paying a dowry for your wife. An old story goes like this, that uh, this man had three daughters and the two daughters were married off and the men they married paid a handsome dowry for each of them. But his third daughter was not all that talented and she really wasn't all that beautiful. And try as he may, he could not marry this young girl off. No one would pay the dowry. And eventually a man came along and he didn't want to just pay two cows or five cows. He said to the man whose daughter could not be married, I want to give you 150 cows for this lady. Now that doesn't fit into American culture very well, does it? I wouldn't pay a hundred. Well, I don't know. Never mind. I'm not going there. <laughs> this man saw the beauty of this girl and he said, I will give more than what is expected. Do you know what happened to that girl? Her shoulders were back and her head went up and she took on a glow and she became a beautiful woman of the village because someone thought so highly of her that he was willing to give so much to have her as his wife. God's idea isn't that we would just give and receive love, that, but that we would actually become love, that it would become so much a part of our lives that it's not just what we do, it is who we are. So as we open the 13th chapters of first, first Corinthians, let's just kind of investigate it, uh, investigate together. What is love? What is it really all about? He can, we can categorize two things as we read that list. It talks about what love is and isn't and what love does and doesn't do. So let's go through the list. You'll have to highlight them because they're not in exact order, but it says this, love is who we are. Love is. It deals with the seat of our emotions. Love is the motivator in our lives. Those things that we can't just seem to hide. If you love someone, it just bubbles over and people know it. It's not something that you want to hide. <laughs> if you love someone, it just happens. It just flows out from you. 
His list begins with this, love is patient and love is kind. These two things speak of love's tenderness and acceptance. Love is patient and love is kind. My wife was standing at the counter the other day and I wanted to get past her because the coffee, she was in the way of my coffee. And I, I tried to be patient, but I wanted my coffee. And um, something inside of me said, oh, oh, Chuck, <laughs> listen to you. <laughs> and so I waited patiently. And finally, I said, could you scoot over so I could get my coffee? <laughs> But love, patient love goes far beyond those little instances of life. Patience goes way beyond those little things that irritate us, where she puts the toothpaste, how she drives the car, he drives the car. It goes way beyond all of those things. It says to the individual, I know you, I know your flaws, I know who you are and I choose to love you anyway. And that's where the tenderness becomes evident. A newlywed couple can't just say, I'm gonna fix this person and I'm gonna take care of all their flaws. They have to become tender towards one another. Then he goes on and tells us what love is not. Love is not proud. There's no room for machismo in love. There's no room for strutting and prideful talk in love. Love is not self-seeking. Love does not envy. Love is not easily angered. What's going on on the inside manifests itself out here. In fact, James 4, 1 says, what causes fights and quarrels among you, don't they come from your desires, this in here, that battle within you? What's in here is manifest out there in life and what we do. There are some things that love does not do. Listen to this part of the list. Love does not boast. Love does not dishonor the other person. You ever hear of a public speaker, politician, pastor, or whoever, who was saying something that he wished the rest of the world hadn't heard, but later on discovered that his mic was on? <laughs> And suddenly it gets blasted to the whole group and they realize what's really in his heart. I've made this my rule of life and I try my hardest. I want to live as if the microphone is always on. So when I'm talking and when I'm saying and when I'm listening, I want to act and think as if the whole world could hear what I have to say because I don't want to dishonor another person by what I say. Love keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. Our, our interactions with others should always leave them better than when we first talk to them. There's next what love always does. Love is a disposition. Love is not just a condition of the heart like tenderness. Love is a disposition. It is a, a posture that we take. Love always protects. Love always trusts. Love always hopes. Love always expects and anticipates the best of the other person. George was laying in the hospital bed and he woke up, his eyes were fuzzy and he could barely see. There was a big pain in his chest and there were instruments poking him everywhere and he could hear the heartbeat of a machine and sure enough, 
his beloved wife, Frida, was hovering right over him. And he said, Frida, is that you? She said, yes, it's me. She said, you've had a heart attack, but you're going to be okay. He said, good, I'm glad to hear that. He said, Frida, do you remember when we went on our first date and on the way home, we had a terrible car accident and I broke four or five bones in my body and I laid in bed for weeks at a time? She said, yes, George, I remember. He thought for a minute and he said, Frida, you were there. Frida said, yes, I was. He said, Frida, remember when on our wedding night, we, we went to our new home and in the middle of the night, the home caught on fire and I was burned over three quarters of my body and I laid in the hospital for months at a time. And she said, oh, George, I remember. I remember. He said, Frida, you were there. She said, George, I was, I was there. And George looked at Frida and said, Frida, you are bad luck. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming, did you? <laughs> Love always thinks the best of the other person, doesn't it? It always assumes the best. And because it does, it can persevere through the most difficult of situation. Loving people means that we love them without an agenda because as soon as there is an agenda involved, it stops being love and it becomes manipulation. Love is not just tender. It doesn't just come from the heart, but it has this disposition of wanting to love and care for the other person. It can never have an agenda. And then he says, this is what love never does. He concludes by saying, love never fails. Love never fails. He concludes the chapter by saying words like this. Now we see in a, dark, in a, in a glass that's fuzzy, but when we see him face to see face, we'll know all things and we will be known. We do our best to love. We give it everything we have. We allow the Lord to love through us. We receive his grace. But my friends, it will not be until we see Jesus Christ face to face that we will behold the whole thing, we will, be love, we will behold love and know it to its fullest. So we keep trying, we keep working at it, we keep doing our best, we keep loving and loving, but it will fall a little bit short until we get our glorified body and we stand before our maker who gave his life for us. Brendan Mannon wrote something I want to read to you. It's in your bulletin. I think you can read it along. Jesus talked to his friends a lot about how we should identify your, ourselves. He said, it wouldn't be what we said we believed or all the good we hope to do someday. Nope. He said, we would identify ourselves simply by how we loved people. It's tempting to think that there's more to it, but there's not. Love isn't something we fall into. Love is some, someone that we become. My friends, my heart's desire, my longing is to love God, my heavenly father, with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, and with all of my strength, and to love my neighbors as myself. Wow. And so let love be the leading principle of North Lake Church of the Nazarene. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what does that look like? I mean, I would guess that most of us already love each other, at least to some degree. 
We put up with each other all these years and we still come and we're still here. We love each other. We care about each other. We know when things are going wrong. Um, we're a loving church, right? We are. So what does that mean? How do we love each other? How do we put feet and how do we take it one, one step further? It's easier and easier for me to love my wife. The longer I spend with her, the more I love her. Boy, howdy. I can't imagine a life without her. And I love her deeper every day. And we've enjoyed that love together as a congregation. But maybe God wants to take us to another level. Maybe he wants us to see love with kingdom eyes and discover what that means. Could it be that God wants me to love the ones I don't understand? Could it be that God wants me to do more than just learn a person's name, but learn about their life and fill our lives with people who don't look like us or act like us or even believe the same things we do? Is that how the church is to love? I think it's how Jesus loved. It's, it's inviting them to do things with us. It's, go to, it's going to, to find the ones everyone else has shunned or turned away from. It's to see them as neighbors, even though they are totally different than we are. Oh, now love becomes a bit uncomfortable. And I sense God kind of pushing me out, out into the water. And it's like, oh man, I haven't charted that water before. I'm not sure what it feels like. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do, and it's going to be awkward and comfortable and painful. I like loving those people that I'm with. There's a reason I'm with them. But maybe, maybe God is calling us to the see others with kingdom eyes of love that gives them the same love as I do those that I deeply care about. Wow. Wow. And so we can be a loving church. That's wonderful. But we want to be a loving church with kingdom eyes. You ever take off your glasses and see how things look without them? Maybe you have better vision than me, but I can barely make out who you are without my glasses. What would happen? if we put on the kingdom eyes of Jesus, all the fuzziness would disappear and we could see people clearly the way that Jesus loves them. One person said this, I want people to meet me and feel like they've just met everyone in heaven. I like that. And so, when we read 1 Corinthians 13, it gives us great, great insight into how we love those that we already like. <laughs> and it teaches us how to love those that are unlikable. Bob Goff says, everybody always. Can, can, I, can, can I confess? All of our Church of the Nazarene, did I say it right? Northly, I'm in, I'm in the right place. He's called us to be lovers of people and to meet them like this, not like this. Amen? Amen. In a year from now, in a year from now, I, I don't know what are, I don't know where we are today, so I have to say a year from now. Could we be known as the North Lake Church of the Nazarene, the church that just loves people? Could we just become known as that church? We know churches that do well. They have lights and sound and this and that and programs. Could we just make that our calling card, the church that loves people? I like the sound of that, don't you? I'm going to ask the musicians to come. They're going to play after the benediction this morning and kind of send us on our way.
But um, would you stand with me today? I'm learning to love you and I'm enjoying every minute of it. Um, I feel like we're beginning a long journey together. It's gonna take us a long time to get acquainted. We may even get a little irritated at once in each other once in a while, but that's okay because God has called us to make it through, to love each other. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, help us to just grasp the depth of the grace and mercy that you have given us. Lord, help us to just cling to you, lean heavily into you, until your love permeates every portion of our lives. Draw us close to you. And October 1st of 2023, I pray that we will have a reputation in this community and beyond. This is the church that really knows how to love people. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of the Lord. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. That he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turned his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath that brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom.